Actually, there's a lot of things I don't understand about this essay, and one is I'm not sure I can give a good explanation of why it's called experience. <laughs> Uh, but um, there's some things I do understand about it, so I'm just talk about it. Um, so uh, I guess, um, as I mentioned before, a lot of people feel that there's a big change in Emerson between what came before and this essay. That this is like a Marx a turning point. I'm not even sure at this point where I, whether I think that or not. It certainly has parts that sound much darker. <laughs> um, but, you know, I mean, so does self reliance, really, if you think about it. Uh, well, in any case, leaving aside that kind of vague and unanswerable question, I'll start talking about what is actually going on here. So it's, um, as with uh, I guess all of Emerson's essays, it's a little bit hard to follow in terms of what is, why one thing is coming after another, or maybe very hard to follow. But at least in this case, there is uh, not fully advertised, but kind of explicit structure to it, right? So there's a list near the end. This is on page 83, the edition I put up. Uh, illusion, temperament, succession, surface, surprise, reality, subjectiveness. These are the threads on the loom of time. These, these are the lords of life. So, I mean, on the one hand, that's that alludes back to that poem at the beginning with the lords of life, although actually the two lists don't completely match up. <laughs> Which, uh, um, well, I have something to say about a few of the places they don't match up, but probably won't get to, to all of them. But, but it also more directly refers to these um, running heads on the top of the page, right? Like here it says surprise. And those were in the first edition. So, I mean, that's Emerson put those in there on purpose. And, um, and usually when you, so there's never a heading in the text that says, you know, like section five, surprise or whatever. But usually when it switches from one to another, there's a break between the paragraphs. Not in every case, however. There's one that seems to start at the top of the page, so there couldn't be a break. I believe that would be surprise. Starts, I think, at the top of page 69. Um, so you, you can't tell because those headings are only on every other page, right? So this page says experience. This one says surface. And when you turn the great page, it says surprise. It's starting in the middle of the paragraph. So I assume surprise starts at the top of this page. But there's also um, the switch. Uh, the, probably the most important transition in the essay is the one between reality and subjectiveness, or what it says up on top is subject or the one. And that appears to take place at the bottom of Oh, yeah, at the bottom of page 76. And there's no break. Um, and, and there's no new heading until the top of page 78, so it's really not clear. But um, once again, otherwise, 
the break would have to be in the middle of a paragraph. And anyway, something drastic seems to happen at the bottom of page 76. So I think that's where that transition is. Okay, I mean, why not put like headings in the text so you know exactly where the transition is? Um, you know, again, Emerson is being slippery to use one of his own metaphors that he uses <laughs> in this essay. Um, he's, um, but I don't know how to say more about it than that. Well, but anyway, so um, so these are the. There may or may not be an introductory paragraph before the first section. I'm calling these sections. Uh, you know, the first one is illusion. The second one is temperament. Succession. Purpose. Surprise. Reality. Subject or one. And then after this, there's kind of a concluding section. There's another break in the text. So I'm calling that the conclusion. Um, and in some places, there's a really abrupt shift in mood of the essay um, at the beginning of the new section. So one place that's especially evident is the beginning of a section called Circus. It's on page 61. But what help from these fineries or pedantries? What help from thought? Life is not dialectics, etc. Right now, um, apparently, the the question is how much of what came, comes before that is being rejected as, or at least in this new mood, being rejected as fineries or pedantries. Is it everything since the beginning? Is it um, um, I mean I'm tempted to think, but I'm not sure this is right. It could be just the last paragraph that we just had. Of course, it needs the whole society to give the symmetry we seek. Um, ending. Like a bird which alights nowhere but hops perpetually from bough to bough is the power with the capital P, which abides in no man and in no woman, but for a moment speaks from this one and for another moment from that one. Um, right, that's kind of the up, one of the up points of the essay. Like after complaining through uh, uh, most of that, short section on succession. He's been complaining before that also about the tragedy of the fact that uh, no particular is ever permanently satisfying to us and in included in that as particular other people, right? Then he's, he ends it with this paragraph saying, of course, it needs the whole society to give the symmetry we seek. And it's saying that, you know, your mistake was to look for it in some particular individual. It's everyone put together, right? And so it, it reaches this high note where there's a power with a capital P that's hopping from one person to another. <laughs> and that's what you have to follow. Um, similar to, I mean, certainly, some version of the same thought he was giving in the poet about how you have, you know, you can't hold on to the symbol. You have to keep following the symbol as it tracks new meanings or something like that. Um, but anyway, then there's a break and then he says, but what help from these fineries or pedantries? So it could be just that last paragraph. Um, but on the other hand, uh, it could be because um, 
in a sense, these three sections go together and these three sections go together. Well, I'll say why in a moment, but I guess like these three sections are more abstractly about the situation we find ourselves in. And these three sections are about the different elements of the situation and how they go together. So it could be that he's complaining about this whole treatment at the beginning of the section on surface. All right, so that's just one of many examples of where my understanding currently gives out. <laughs> I feel like I understand it better than I did last time I lectured on it. And I feel like before I lectured on it last time, I understood it better than I used to understand it. So I think progress. <laughs> Um, um, well, okay, anyway, that's one example. The um, more important example, I think, I don't know, actually, if that really makes marks a big break between these two groups, then maybe that's also important. But the other um, striking example is between reality and subject, right? And that's what I was just talking about at the bottom of page 76. So the end, what I take to be the end of the section on reality, again, is one of the like up points in the, like one of the good mood points in the essay, right? It starts onward and onward. In liberated moments, we know that a new picture of life and duty is already possible. The elements already exist in many minds around you of a doctrine of life which shall transcend any record, written record that we have, etc. Right? So it's like, yeah, this is, you know, we, find, we got to the end of this and say, actually, things are great. <laughs> and then the new section starts, it is very unhappy, but too late to be helped, the discovery we have made that we exist. <laughs> that discovery is called the fall of man, <laughs> right? So that's, I think, is an uh, abrupt change in mood. Um, sometimes there's also a change in mood midsection, though. I mean, for example, I already mentioned how that happens in succession, which is a very short section, but, you know, for a lot of it, he's talking about this tragic fact, and then at the end, he says, but actually, it's okay, but it's, you know, at least, does that really make it okay? <laughs> it's, it's kind of a weird consolation, but anyway, it is some kind of consolation. Um, okay, so, so that's, um, That's a beginning sketch of, that, of the structure of the whole essay. And there's also, though, a kind of basic theme that runs through it. Um, I mean, so again, you'd expect the theme to be experience. <laughs> Maybe I sort of understand this in a weird way. Let's think about it. I mean, so, so here's the theme. The theme is that what Emerson calls life or human life sometimes um, is a mixture or temperament. So Right, this word temperament actually means mixture. Um, now, I mean, we don't use it. Well, actually, we come close to using it to mean mixture sometimes when we talk about tempering the heat of something. Um, did you have a question? Well, yeah, just like, what's the particular Latin word of that? Because I'm if I'm high school. I guess it's temporary. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, but it's used to translate the Greek term um, process, which means mixture, right? So, um, and so the reason temperament and 
temperature and temperate <laughs> mean the things they do for us is because of ancient theories about the mixtures of the elements and the mixtures of the four humans in the body, basically. Right? So, like, a thing has a certain what we call temperature because it's a mixture of hot and cold elements. Um, and like a temperate climate is a climate where there's a you know, proper balanced mixture, right, as opposed to uh, too much cold or too much hot. Um, and someone's, what we call someone's temperament is, was supposed to result from like a mixture of humors in the brain. I mean, like all diseases are, well, actually, I don't know if all diseases, but anyway, it's a general theory of disease that diseases are caused by an imbalanced mixture of the humors in the body. The humors are black bile, yellow bile, blood, and phlegm. <laughs> right. So, uh, um, and like sometimes that gets off, you know, temporarily due to some external cause. Um, but, um, uh, but you also, everyone has like a basic constitution, which consists in their kind of normal mixture of the humors. And so some people are phlegmatic, they have more phlegm, some people are choleric, they have more yellow bile, whatever. And particularly the mixture in the brain is, I mean, well, that is, according to Galen, it's the brain. According to Aristotle, it's the heart. Yes, but in between they discovered that it's not really the heart, it's really the brain. So, <laughs> um, right, so the mixture in the brain, you know, controls what we would call your temperament. So, um, so um, now, so you, I mean, you expect based on this like analogy to be talking about a mixture of four elements or four humors. The four humors are correlated with the four elements. And so, you know, but anyway, um, so, uh, um, but Emerson um, throughout this essay seems to be talking about a mixture of two elements. Right, the two elements are what in the beginning he calls earth and fire. And so he says, um, did our birth fall in some fit of indigence and frugality in nature that she was so she was so sparing of her fire and so liberal of her earth? Right. So that's those are the two elements. I think that later on. Well, I mean, okay, I know that later on he describes human life as made of two elements. This is on page 67. Uh, I'm just reading what it says. Human life is made of two elements, of the two elements, power and form. Um, I take it that those are kind of like more abstract, more universal terms for that same context. So like a little algebra. Maybe <laughs> instead of these village symbols, and uh, but which goes with which? And I think the answer is that this is power, this is form. And maybe. Well, okay, so let me say the thing that I don't think is maybe, and then say what I do think is maybe. So, um, Schelling um, describes uh, self consciousness as involving a synthesis of two activities the finite activity and the infinite activity. Um, and a product that emerges from both. That was the imagination, I guess. So this is on page 51 in the Schelling book. 
in as much as the opposing activities of self-consciousness merge. And the thing translated as merge here is dream, they like interfuse through each other. Um, this is this is exactly a definite, this is exactly a description of what type of composition process is supposed to be. Process is a composition where the ingredients, you know, like interpenetrate each other. And then there's a dispute between Aristotle and Aristotelians and Stoics about what interpenetrates and what doesn't. But anyway, so um, so I think you know, Shelling in talking calling the describing the synthesis in this way is perhaps intends or anyway certainly suggests to someone who's thinking of this metaphor that um, that self-consciousness results from a kind of temperament like mixture of what well of a finite and infinite activity Um, so, I mean, um, that this is supposed to somehow match up with shelling, or is supposed to somehow be comparable to shelling, I think is true because, um, the question, where do we find ourselves, is basically the question of how does transcendental reflection take place, right? The question that experience opens with, where do we find ourselves? And, you know, in the case that's uh, like, doesn't seem explicit enough, remember that at the beginning of this last section here, he does say in more more philosophical sounding language, right? It is an un unhappy discovery we have made that we exist. The discovery that we exist is transcendental reflection, right? I mean, that's that could be a quote from Schelling, basically, right? The first the first principle is I am. So, um, um, so that so that these mixtures are somehow supposed to be the same mixture and that in both cases a third thing kind of emerges out of it. So this is where the third thing emerges in Emerson. This is on page 72, the section on reality near the beginning. Um, uh, Oh, yeah, the miracle of life, which will not be expounded, but will remain a miracle, introduces a new element. The mixture between these two things, basically, introduces a new element, and that's the topic of this section. So these two things, I think, again, correspond to or power, right? Surface is about how um, we only know the outside of it. And uh, um, and it always, everything has a form that it just stays under forever and doesn't expand beyond. And then surprise suddenly talks about how, but actually, if you relied on that, you, you would be surprised because um, every once in a while, something breaks in, <laughs> right? So I think that that's form and power. Later on in this later collection of essays called The Conduct of Life, I wanted to assign these essays, but there wouldn't be time for them. He wrote two essays called Fate, 
power. Again, a thinker about the same contrast. So, um, so all of that so far, I think, is right. The only question is whether you can whether you can say, oh, so this is finite and this is infinite, or something like that. I think it would go that way. And in that case, if we say that the that you know nature mixed in too much earth, that would mean that we have too much of this and not enough of this. <laughs> so that's definitely what I said last time I taught this course. In between, I wrote a blog post where I said that I didn't think that would work. And now I'm kind of in the mood work again. So um, <laughs> but uh, but uh, yeah, I'm not sure. Um, um, so incidentally, the question of how these things match up with the poem at the beginning, for that thing where he says, um, the miracle of life which will not be expounded, but will remain a miracle. Um, and uh, uh, just back out. Oh yeah, page 74. Fortune, Minerva, Muse, Holy Ghost, these are quaint names too narrow to cover this unbounded substance. The baffled intellect must still kneel before this cause which refuses to be named. Right, so this third element that this section called reality introduces is something that refuses to be named or can't be expounded. So I think that's, what he's talking about in the poem at the beginning when he says, uh, and the inventor of the game omnipresent without name. Right, so that means that reality is mentioned in the poem at the beginning. And I believe that here, this one um, corresponds to Little Man who's mentioned in near the end of the poem. Um, so, um, and assuming that this is the same as dream, all the sections actually are mentioned in the poem. Then the only problem is the poem mentions two other things, use and spectral long, which don't appear to have sections. <laughs> um, okay. Um, All right, so I mean, whether or not this lines up exactly, I think uh, we are asking Schelling's question, where do we find ourselves? How do we find ourselves to exist? So in what circumstances do we come to recognize our own existence? Um, and we're giving Schelling's answer, we find ourselves in a kind of a mixture um, of of two different activities or something, two different elements. But unlike Schelling, Emerson says, at least this is clearly what he's saying at the beginning, that the temperature, the temperament in which we find ourselves is a distemper. It's not well-tempered, right? So it's like diseased. Um, in particular, the temperament in which we find ourselves is lethargy. Um, and in fact, I looked this up, <laughs> I found this in Galen. Do you know who Galen is? 
it's like kind of the father of Western medicine. Well, I mean, I guess it depends where you count it from, but I mean, because there's Hippocrates is kind of a semi-mythical figure, but Galen was to the medical literature in the Middle Ages what Aristotle was to, to philosophy. Um, and he's, you know, he's later, I guess, first, second century, sometime around then, AD. But, um, um, and, you know, he has a lot of philosophical interests and opinions, and in some way, in many ways, he's, he's a peripatetic, actually, but he talks about a lot of things that Aristotle doesn't talk about. So, anyway, Galen says that lethargy results from an excess of phlegm in the brain. <laughs> so lethargy is a temperament. It's a distemperament. Now, so what is this condition, lethargy? Well, um, basically, like, the way we still use the word now is what lethargy meant then, like lethargia, I guess. Um, did you have a question? Yeah, I mean, I don't know if this is the best time to ask it. But yeah, it has to do with the behaviors. But um, it will, um, so I'm wondering like how the ancients, and I guess probably people in the Middle Ages, just thought about uh, the, the soul with regard to personality and, and the humors with regard to it, it seems like you're really arguing for kind of like materialist view of the, the person. Right. But, so, so Galen actually was a materialist and he interpreted Aristotle as a materialist as many people do now. I mean, of course, not a materialist in the sense of a mechanist, right? That is not thinking that bodies only have extension and its modes and can only act on each other by impulse. He's aware of people who say that, but he thinks it's wrong. You can't explain the body that way. You can't explain physical processes that way. And in fact, he gives the explanation, he gives the example of magnets and, uh, and electron like so that is he gives the examples of electricity and magnetism as examples of attractive and repulsive powers that don't act by impulse. And he says that organs of the body have that too. But having said all of that, yeah, he's he's a materialist and he actually uses this kind of thing in, in his arguments for materialism. I mean, you don't of course really have to go this far on the field. You could just which she also mentions, just say, well, look what happens to you when you drink alcohol, <laughs> right? So, um, yeah, I mean, on the other hand, people who interpret Aristotle differently say that, you know, although the human intellect, at least, is a separate substance, uh, you know, at least in this, in this life, it can't function properly without using the body as an organ or instrument. And so when the body is uh, distempered, it, you know, impedes its um, activities, but it's, met, but it's still a separate substance. That's, I mean, that doesn't make a very long story short. <laughs> um, uh, how that whole controversy might apply to Emerson. I mean, it does have some relevance to what's going on in this essay, but I'm not sure I can make the right connection with this. <laughs> um, so, um, I mean, Emerson in this essay talks about, you know, like men being like drunk and <laughs> um, But, uh, okay, so, so what I was starting to say before that question was that um, lethargy then meant the same thing it does now. Right, like a kind of inertia that makes it difficult to, to do anything. They can just feel like staying, you know, staying there or whatever. Um, so, uh, but it has this root in it, which means forgetfulness. Um, so, um, so actually, this also interestingly is in the passage where that I found where Galen discusses lethargy. He says that um, an excess of phlegm in the brain causes lethargy and also harms the memory. 
But I think he's trying to explain why, what this has to do with forgetfulness, basically. Um, but um, obviously, uh, you know, Emerson is deliberately equating those two somehow, right? That it's both an inability to act and a kind of forgetfulness. The, the genius that gave us the leafy to drink when we came into this world. Right, so that's referring to this myth, um, uh, the, at least the form of it in the Republic is that, you know, bef right before you're reborn, they make you drink the, the waters of the river Leafy, and so that's why you don't remember your previous lives. <laughs> um, so, um, right, so Emerson says, this is still like in the first, paragraph, but the genius, which according to the old belief, stands at the door by which we enter and gives us the leafy to drink, that we may tell no tales, mix the cup too strongly, right, that he didn't temper the cup properly. That, I think, by the way, temp well, that's probably true of process as well. Temperare in Latin, I think the primary use of it was mixing water into your wine. They used to mix water into wine. There's also some kinds of wine that they used to mix seawater into, which sounds disgusting. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, so uh, mix the cup too strongly, and we cannot shake off the lethargy now at noonday. So, um, okay, so so like that's what the essay opens with. The act of transcendental reflection has, so to speak, failed or miscarried because we were in the wrong temperament or wrong constitution when we did it. At least that's what it seems like to us. Um, and then he comes back to that, as I said, explicitly at the end, in, but in this section, he begins by saying, it's an unhappy discovery we've made that we exist. Um, right, like Schelling wouldn't say that. Coleridge wouldn't say that. It's not unhappy. It's the best thing, <laughs> right? Um, Emerson says, it's unhappy. It's gone wrong somehow. Um, And in between those two are then are these two groups of sections that, like I said, this one seems to be talking um, kind of in general terms about the kind of predicament we're in. Right? Like illusion is really about the effects of this lethargy how it interferes with our um, being able to find ourselves reflected in an object or make meaningful contact with an object. Um, and then temperament and succession are, I guess, like kind of breaking that down farther. Right, so because I mean, I think that's the right way to explain it because the succession section starts. Um, well, that, that is the temperament section starts dream delivers us to dream, and there's no end to illusion. Life is a train of moods like a string of beads, and as we pass through them, blah blah blah, and then somewhere he says, temperament is the iron wire. The, the beads are strung on, right? So, um, so that has something to do with the mechanics of illusion, so to speak. And the same topic is continued or looked at from a different point of view or something in the section on succession, which starts the secret of the illusoriness is in the necessity of a succession of moods or objects. And all of those things are things that come back in this final section. 
right? How we need one object after another. And, uh, we can't uh, we can't connect with any particular object. It's like that. Um, so, um, and then there's these that, like I said, I, it seems like each one of these kinds of makes a one-sided case for one of the elements. I think that's what kind of like accounts for the switches and, you know, um, like where it sounds like we're reaching a really de definite conclusion and then the next section takes it back. <laughs> that each one of these is speaking for one of these elements, so to speak. Um, and by the way, if you wonder how a third, how an element can emerge from a mixture, <laughs> right? I mean, the whole idea of an element is that it's elementary, it's not a mixture. So I think that's what Emerson um, um, is uh, trying to get at when he talks, and hopefully I'll get a chance to talk about this in more detail, but when he talks in reality about the coetaneous growth, um, right? Like he says that someone, Sir Everhart, how <laughs> like supposedly noticed that the development of the embryo doesn't proceed from a single center, but that there's like different centers that grow next to each other. I guess this is not true. I mean, it starts from one cell, right? But anyway, it, he thought he had discovered that, you know, so like, I mean, at first what they thought, the reason we call it, um, uh, development, which means like unwrapping, <laughs> is that, you know, Schleibitz claims that when he looked inside a, you know, you know, it wasn't Leibniz, and of course he didn't do this himself. Uh, was it Leibniz book or whatever? Anyway, people claimed that when they looked uh, at a sperm under a microscope that they saw a little human being inside. <laughs> This is called the theory of preformation, right? That, like, you know, there actually is a little human being inside, and all it has to do is kind of like expand and unwrap itself. <laughs> um, so, um, so, but instead, this other guy is saying, no, if you look at the development of the embryo, you'll see that there's, there's different centers that each develop themselves independently. And yet the result is a unified organism. Um, so um, the way Emerson interprets that is something like um, there was always a single principle, the life of this organism, only it wasn't manifest. Um, it's kind of like behind the scenes. The separate centers are growing on their own in accordance with its principle. And only when they're finished does the unifying principle emerge. Right? So he says, um, said I wasn't going to get into details in this yet, but I guess I'm not. This where he's already using this metaphor. He says, bear with these distractions with this coetaneous growth of the parts. I don't know why he uses that word coetaneous. Coetaneous really means like contemporary, like alive at the same time, belonging to the same age. But here he means more something more like simultaneous and independent. But anyway, bear with these distractions with this coetaneous growth of the parts. They will one day be members and obey one will. On that one will, on that secret cause, they yell our attention and hope. Right? So the answer is that this third principle is really there all the, all the time, but it can only be manifest when these things have like mixed uh, properly. 
so it is an element, and yet it depends on a mixture. Um, okay, so um, why does this particular distemper lead to this state of our life that Emerson describes in, under illusion? Yeah, I mean, the more I think of it, I'm not sure how to describe the relationship between these three sections. They're really all about illusion, temperament, and succession. <laughs> Right, like as I said, this one already starts by saying one mood succeeds another. Um, but um, but yeah, somehow they emphasize each one emphasizes a different aspect of it. I'm not sure, but in any case, um, apparently the problem is, I mean. If I said, uh, we have too much of one of these, never mind which one it is, we have too much of one of these, um, why would that mean that, uh, that our state is one of being enclosed in illusion. Um, which means, so illusion here is being understood as, um, I mean, I guess there's different ways to think about what illusion is. Um, but illusion here is being understood as like um, a screen that we can't see beyond. Mm -hmm that we can't sense beyond, right? We're like enclosed in it and it keeps us from making real contact. That's, that's why in that first paragraph, he says, um, our life is not so much threatened as our perception. Ghost-like, we glide through nature. We should not know our place again. Not know our place again means we wouldn't be able to find our way back to the same place, or if we did, we wouldn't know it was the same place because we don't really know where we are. Um, so, um, or in the next paragraph, if any of us knew what we were doing or where we were going, then when we think we best know. Meaning we don't, right? But it's even when we think we best know, we don't know what we are doing and where we are going. So yeah, maybe I shouldn't, maybe wrong to think of it as like a screen between us and something else. It's like a screen between us and ourselves. Um, at the same time, or because it's a screen between us and everything else. We never get to confront. Um, the um, the limit that we would need to confront in order to really become objects of ourselves. So that means both that we don't really ever know the world and that we don't really ever know ourselves. Um, and the reason is, I take it because, you know, somehow because of the imbalance between these things, at least this is one way of explaining it, that um, the way the finite is supposed to be able to symbolize the infinite doesn't work. Yeah. So there is no self knowledge as in shape. Is that the term? Well, there's, I mean, there's like an attempt at it, but it miscarries, right? Like, so where do we find ourselves? We are finding ourselves, but it doesn't work right. So is it maybe <laughs> why he said self-reliance is the, the key and not self-knowledge? 
I guess that was an earlier essay. It is an earlier essay. He does mention self-reliance again near the end of this one. Um, I wasn't sure how to put that together with everything else, um, but maybe somehow that would work. You see, I don't think I wrote that down because I didn't know what to do. But can I find it? Is it in the conclusion? Or I know it's near the end. Oh yeah, here it is, on the, on the top of page 82. Well, okay, let me start that here. It is true that all the muses and love and religion hate these developments. What these developments are is basically something about how everything we're doing is like puss with her tail, like a cat chasing its tail. But, um, and we'll find a way to punish the chemist who publishes in the parlor the secrets of the laboratory. And we cannot say too little of our constitutional necessity of seeing things under private aspects or saturated with our humors. Again, this has something to do with this temperament, right? You see things saturated with our humors. Um, so we can't say too little of it, meaning we shouldn't say very much of it. <laughs> even though he just said a lot about it. But then he says, and yet is the God the native of these bleak rocks? And then the next sentence is, that need makes in morals the capital virtue of self-trust. So there is some kind of conclusion about self-reliance or self-trust towards the end. Um, Don't know that in context it's really it's really substitutes for self knowledge. I mean, I would think that whatever imbalance there is here would cause the same problem as self trust. Isn't it? You know, like we said that we don't know what we're doing or where we're going. That kind of knowledge, um, lacking that kind of knowledge, is not just not knowing some facts, right? Uh, like, how can you rely on yourself if you don't know what you're doing or where you're going? I don't know. Well, maybe you could say that is what he means by self reliance yeah. and self reliance that you don't know where you're going, but you just trust yourself. Yeah, yeah I don't know. Yeah, maybe, maybe that's the right way to put it. Um, but um, but whatever this problem is, it doesn't just impact knowledge. It also impacts creation in action. Um, right, getting back again to this, like at the very beginning. He says, um, bottom of page 49, though we have health and reason, yet we have no superfluity of spirit for new creation. We have enough to live and bring the year about, but not an ounce to impart or to invest. Ah, that our genius were a little more of a genius. <laughs> So, meaning, I guess, you know, ah, that our genius had managed to make the finite a symbol of the infinite, the way genius is supposed to do. But it didn't really work, or something like that. 
where it feels like it didn't work. I mean, I keep going back and forth between those things because they, you know, the conclusion is is ambiguous, at least to me. And it's really unclear what note he ends on, or you know, whether in the end he, he after going through all this, we're actually supposed to realize that um, that I mean, this is the way your comment is going. I think. Right, but at the end, we're supposed to realize that, like, we've just been looking for the wrong thing. You know, we wanted certainty, but that's not, we thought we wanted certainty, knowledge, whatever, but that's not really what we wanted. Um, I mean, the thing about that is that he really sounds like he's saying that in this section. And then there's that transition where suddenly things seem bad again. <laughs> So I, I don't know, but yeah, so I'm, that's why, but that's why since I'm not sure I keep saying like either it really went wrong somehow, or at least it seems to us like it really went wrong, wrong somehow. Um, and it seems to us that, um, um, and poetry is impossible for us. Um, poetry in the true sense where it has to be original. I mean, he says on page 51 that the history of literature is a sum of very few ideas and very few original tales. Um, so in this great society wide lying around us, a critical analysis would find very few spontaneous actions. It is almost all custom and gross sense. So, um, um, well, I guess, I mean, I guess that's just what I was saying before, but as I, but then maybe again, it doesn't interfere with what you were trying to say that the problem here, the problem of lacking self-knowledge is not just a problem of not knowing everything you might want to know. It's a problem of not being someone in the right way, right? Like not being able to, to tell your own tale, which is what he said, we, we, we were given the Lethe so that we might not tell tales, but we got too much of it. Right, like so to speak. Not only can't we tell tales of our previous lives, we can't tell any tales at all. <laughs> um, 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 So, um, right, so because we're in this state of illusion, um, in this sense where illusion means not seeing things that aren't there or even believing things that aren't true. But, 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 you know, it's just um, but it means like um, being shut out of our own originality. Um, that um, um, and the reason for that is because we we don't find something in the world that can like resist us in the right way. But again, like as I was saying, you know, what we need is if this is the infinite self, and this is the finite self. We needed to impose this limit and then con continuously overcome it, right? So, so we needed the world to be sufficiently like um, resisting <laughs> that we could overcome it. 
And that overcoming is the, is the symbolic representation of the infinity of the infinite self. So we so that's basically what's missing here. This lethargy means that um, we can't remember where we came from, so to speak. We can't remember where we came from because um, we don't find the world just always recedes before us. We can't get it to push back. <laughs> um, and that's where the thing about grief comes in. Right, and in particular about the death of his son, little Waldo. So, um, what he wanted out of grief, <laughs> or I guess, I mean, <clears throat> what he realizes that he missed in grief, I guess is the right way to put it, right? So he says that after being through his experience, he grieves that he cannot grieve, right? Like he, this terrible thing happened to him and it left him feeling um, rather than uh, feeling that the, the world had somehow hit him, <laughs> It left him feeling that there was just nothing there, but he just slipped through it, right? So, um, you know, that's why the, one of the first thing he says about grief is what opium is instilled into all disaster? It shows formidable as we approach it, but there is at last no rough, lasting friction, but the most slippery sliding surfaces. And he quotes this thing about Ate Dea, that is the, the goddess ruin. Does he, does he have a problem with creation or he has a problem with not being able to get to a point where creation becomes something? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, it's, I mean, he's, first of all, he definitely says both. Right, he says that we can't do anything original, we can't create whatever, and he also says that that things don't confront us, they don't they don't have the sharp edges we're looking for. Um so so the answer is both, but the good question is exactly how are those related? Like could I draw that in this diagram and make it clear why? I mean, you know, I think it's clear from, from Schelling and Coleridge really why you'd expect those things to somehow be related, right? I mean, they're both basically forms of um, um, the finite symbolizing the infinite. Both, the, or both, I mean, Look, I guess I, here's how I can draw this picture. It's the same arrow, right? What does the infinite ego create? It creates the world. <laughs> so, um, um, you know, the creation of something in the world is like that raised to a higher power, as Shellen puts it. But it's, it's kind of the same thing. That's so, like, because this never goes right, is neither of them are really there the way they the way they should be. Does that? That's the best I can do right now. <laughs> I hope that's helpful. Um, I mean. Well, you know, actually, when he talks about his son, Emerson does make, I guess, a closer connection here. In the death of my son, now more than two years ago, I seem to have lost a beautiful estate, no more. So, um, The beautiful should be the infinite, finitely represented. But 
what we call beautiful, a beautiful estate is not is is not infinitely valuable. Um, and and the problem is that nothing is like that, not even his son. There's right, I mean, there's something we you might think we, we actually create. <laughs> if nothing else. But no, even there. Right? I mean, I think this is, you know, so a lot of people try to read this whole essay as kind of centered somehow around the death of his son. I'm not sure if that's right or not. It might be. Or it might be that's what we expect because we're saying that we expect it for the wrong reason. But maybe he's talking to himself as uh, having the same predicament as all humans do and not seeing creation the right way. But if he, if he thinks that creation is wrong as well, then shouldn't he like, refuse? A higher being, thus he refuses the higher being. I don't know. Well, it's you know, I mean, the idea here is that the um, given this way, at least of understanding. This is why they ask, maybe this is why they ask, it's called experience. I don't know. I can think of two reasons now why the essay is called experience. Maybe they're the same somehow. One would be that, like, these things are correlated with sense and understanding, or maybe that's the other way around. Yeah, given what Emerson usually says, I think it might be the other way around. But sense and understanding, right? Those are the two components of experience according to Kant. Uh, but the other thing is thinking is that given this understanding of what experience is, uh, experience is like. Um, recognizing the symbol of a higher being. Now, I mean, the higher being is uh, um, the higher being is in some sense, at least yourself. Yeah. Right. So like, and, and Schelling seems to, you know, Schelling seems to be fine with that. It, you know, I mean, he does bring in some stuff about God later, but it's not Obviously, Coleridge thinks that, you know, well, that's really only true for one of us, namely Jesus, right? <laughs> for everyone else, it's more complicated or something like that, right? But, um, uh, and as for Emerson, I mean, I guess you'd have to say it's typically ambiguous. It depends how you read that sentence at the end where he says the God is the native of these bleak rocks. Right, the bleak rocks of the rocks of subjectivity, of my subjectivity. He's saying that God is a native of these bleak rocks. So does that mean I am the God, or, or is it some more, let's say more complicated, but uh, less straightforward relationship, <laughs> right? But I mean, but the point is, like, so whether this higher, what do you want to say this higher being is, is just my own infinite self or not? The, the fact that this has gone long is, I mean, it's a sign that the higher being doesn't have the right relationship to the lower being. <laughs> that's, you know, that's what it means that everything seems like it slips by me. You know, it doesn't confront me. Um, so 
it's not so much grounds for rejecting it in the sense of like not believing in it. I mean, like even, you know, like is this, even for Schelling, it's not clear it's right to call this the object of belief. And for Emerson, where it's, it's, you know, where it's the object of trust, you know, so like it's even less clear. I mean, but um, so the issue isn't really like whether to reject it instead of not believing it, but the question is whether, uh, yeah, isn't it untrustworthy actually? Yeah, this goes against what you were saying. Isn't it untrustworthy because because look, you did it wrong. <laughs> Our genius turned out not to be such a genius. <laughs> um, so uh, I thought you were going to ask a different question, actually, which would be something like, if something has gone wrong with creation, why are you right? <laughs> that would be a good question. That's the most philosophers, no? <laughs> um, well, I don't know about that. I mean, like Schelling, for example, gives a pretty, I think, self-consistent account of why philosophy can be written. Um, um, yeah, I wouldn't say that's most philosophers, but it is characteristic of some philosophers, and Emerson is one of them. Um, you know, another one would be Nietzsche, Kierkegaard, Plato sometimes, maybe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, I wouldn't say it's all philosophers, but it, it's, I, like, there is all there is always some question about why are you writing this, but it's not always this question. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I've often thought that some kind of arguments that, unlike this, look pretty straightforward. Like, let's say something in Descartes, you know, and I assign it to students, and it this probably didn't happen to you guys, or you wouldn't be sitting here, but <laughs> they signed the students and asked them about it afterwards, and it you know becomes clear that they didn't really understand the steps in the argument. Like I remember when I was first a uh, teaching fellow at University of Chicago, and you know, it was supposed to be a discussion-based class. So in those days I actually tried to do better. <laughs> so I came in and they had just read the first meditation, and I was like, okay. So what's the first thing Descartes says? And someone was like, he says we might be dreaming. And I'm like, he says 10 different things before he says we might be dreaming. <laughs> so, but, but I've, I've often thought that if you gave them a simple, similarly complicated argument about something they could actually understand why you would care about, they would have no trouble following it. Right, if we were like healthcare policy or something. <laughs> But when it's about whether the world exists, you're like, I don't understand what you just can't get past the fact that you don't understand why someone is talking about this. Right? But anyway, sorry. That's but I but I feel like um so maybe it is somehow the same question, but the particular way it comes up anyway in Emerson is or might come up is you might say, well, like Emerson obviously. You know, you could think this is an answer to the question I'm raising about where we end up here. That whatever he actually says, you can tell from what he does that he thinks that producing original thoughts is possible. Otherwise, what is he doing? Then when he's talking about self-trust, and then I think that to like reconcile the reconciliation of the T. In the self-trust essay or self lines essay, is the the infinite subject somehow like at fault, like what we believe he is saying here? I don't think he said something like that there. Mm -hmm. um, um, well, I mean, yes and no. Because what he says there, although Schelling also says this, so this is it's always hard to pin these things down. 
right? That that in our times, most people don't do it at all, right? So like, just as Shelley says, most people are in case, don't have an organ or something like that. Emerson says, we dare not say, I think I am. Um, but quote some saint or sage, that's in self-reliance. So it's kind of, you know, similar to what he's saying here in terms of that, um, that we, um, this, I mean, this is an interesting difference between Emerson and Nietzsche, maybe. At least later, Nietzsche, I mean, he wouldn't say we. <laughs> <laughs> but that we, meaning like um, we people in this bad situation, can't say I am. Right? Or he also says there that, you know, everything they say is, is a kind of lie. Their two is not really two, and their four is not really four, right? So they, they, they can't even say two plus two equals four truly. Um, so that, I mean, that's something, but I still, I feel like that's, that's more like what Schelling would say, that, it, that, it, that in some people this doesn't, just doesn't get to a certain stage or something like that. I mean, maybe the consequences of it seem worse in self-reliance than they do in Schelling, but but yeah, I don't, again, I don't get this feeling that we kind of, like we did it, we did it in the wrong circumstance and it came out wrong. <laughs> I don't get that sense in self-reliance. Maybe it's like a, a prognosis of most people. I don't know, because I, in both the poet and Saturn, I thought that he was preaching like so hard that he was, he counted himself as one of the poets and one of the people who said we lie. <laughs> yes. But like then it turns out that he, he is not in that category or, or at least I had the feeling that. Well, I mean, uh, Maybe he sort of talks about the Ubermensch and self reliance and he comes back to. Yeah, I don't, well, I mean, we'll have to talk to the Uber, about the Ubermensch when we get to the Ubermensch, but <laughs> I mean, the. Uh, um, um, Cause that's because that the, the Ubermensch thing really is about yourself, right? It's not really, I mean, there's it, it, it's about setting yourself the task to create the Ubermensch. Mm -hmm. That's what you need to give yourself a law or something like that. Um, yeah, so, uh, I don't know. I mean, that, I, I think that's another way to pose the same question I was asking and say that it doesn't come up in the same strong way as in self reliance and the poet as it does here because even though he does say we there yeah you still you get the feeling that he means um yeah we average people you know um or like what heidegger calls das man you know like that's who's missing it um but uh, either I or perhaps I and you or everyone, if they really read this and understand it or whatever, you know, of course, there's something else we can do. Now, I mean, I haven't got to it, and I guess I might not get to it, but like, you know, one of the weird turning points in here is where he says, like, oh, but I can't go on without mentioning an exception. And then he said, like for a little while, he suddenly seems to say the opposite of what he's been saying. Um, but he's, but it turns out it's not an exception. Like this doesn't apply to everyone. It's like an exception. But this only applies when it's seen from the platform of physics or the platform of ordinary life. Um, Um, 
They thus express the law as it is read from the platform of ordinary life, but must not leave it without noticing the capital exception. For temperament is a power which no man willingly hears anyone praise but himself. I can understand that. Where's that relevant? On the platform of physics, we cannot resist the contracting influences of so-called science. So is the platform of physics the same as the platform of ordinary life, or is it worse? Temperament puts all divinity to rout. Blah, blah, blah. Um, and then he says, I carry the keys of my castle in my hand, ready to throw them at the feet of my Lord whenever and what disguise soever he shall appear. I know he is in a neighborhood hidden among vagabonds. Shall I preclude, preclude my future by taking a high seat and kindly adapting my conversation to the shape of heads? When I come to that, the doctor shall buy me for a cent. So, and here's the part where he really says what the exception is. Temperament is the veto or limitation power in the Constitution, very justly applied to restrain an opposite excess in the Constitution, but absurdly offered as a bar to original equity. When virtue is in presence, all subordinate powers sleep. So this is a political metaphor. It's kind of opposed to Coleridge's political metaphor. It's based on Rousseau, I think. Right? Rousseau says that in the, when the assembly of the people meet, the executive goes out of existence in the presence of its superior. Right, so um, Emerson is putting virtue in that place. So he's, he's saying, what? <laughs> Somehow when virtue, when power actually is present, temperament has to yield the place to it. So, you know, uh, so but like I said, he says that for um, like a page and a half, ending um, the intellect, seeker of absolute truth, or the heart, lover of absolute good, intervenes for our succor. And at one whisper of these high powers, we awake from ineffectual struggles with this nightmare. We hurl it into its own hell and cannot again contract ourselves to so base a state. That's the end of um, temperament, but then succession begins. The secret of the illusoriness is in the necessity of obsession of moods or objects. So we're back in the illusion, even though he said we couldn't put ourselves back in some basic state. So yeah, I don't know. I, I told you there's a lot of things in this essay I don't understand. But I feel like I'm making progress because I feel like I'm getting to understand better what it is I don't understand, at least. Right? Like, I figured out a lot about how he's using different terminology and what the structure is and what's going on. And so now the places that don't work, at least I can say, or that I don't understand, I can say, you know, where they occur and what I don't understand. <laughs> That's, that's the best I expect at this stage. Um, maybe if I teach this course four more times, I'll feel probably not. Anyway, sorry, what was I going to say before we got into it? I don't remember what the question started all off was. Oh, you were asking, but yeah, so I asked another question I expected you would ask about why does he create that if creation is impossible? And the answer is, Yeah, maybe, maybe the answer is that uh, what he does is supposed to speak louder than what he says. That actually is a quote from that. I can't pay attention to what you say because what you do is standing behind you speaking more loudly. <laughs> oh. 
But anyway, um, maybe that's what it means. But then you end up with another question. This is like a question about Socratic irony. So why does he say the wrong thing? What's he trying to do to us? <laughs> right? Like, in other words, you know, so one understanding of Socrates is he does know what virtue is. He's the only one who knows what virtue is. But he goes around telling everyone he doesn't know. That's what irony means, right? At least according to Aristotle's definition of irony, saying less than you know. So then the question would be, well, wait up, hold on a second. If he knows what virtue is, then it must be virtuous for him to tell us that he doesn't know, even though he does. How does that work? <laughs> right. So, um, but I mean, there could be an answer. It's just like the, the question. I think that's similar to the question you might ask about Emerson. If you took that route, I mean, yeah, you could take the route of saying when he says, like, that thing about I'm waiting for my Lord to throw the keys of my castle at his feet. So that does sound like Ubermensch stuff. But then it has the same kind of ambiguities to it as the actual Ubermensch stuff has. <laughs> Right? Like, is it really about predicting that in the future we're going to meet a certain person? Um, Kant says this somewhere, right? I guess he's quoting something from Plato. I'm not sure what he's quoting. But he says, like, uh, that um, if someone we're able to, you know, I forget what the context is. There's something like, if someone were able to, you know, have an intellectual intuition and express what they saw through it, that, you know, he is the very man I seek. <laughs> By which I take it Kant means that, Kant means that kind of sarcastically or whatever, like, you know, like there couldn't be such a person. Um, but all right anyway sorry <laughs> um i don't remember what was going on before but oh i see they're out of time so i you know i think we're almost out of time I mean. so i'm gonna there's definitely a lot more things that could be said about these sec sections in between but i want to you know, skip to say something about what happens at the end. Um, uh, especially because that, I think, is where the connection to Coleridge becomes clearer. So, um, because it starts, it is very unhappy, but too late to be helped. The discovery we have made that we exist, that discovery is called the fall of man. Right, so now we're talking about original sin, I think. <laughs> and as in Coleridge, it seems like the original sin has something to do with the separation. So maybe I was wrong to say that Coleridge wouldn't call it unhappy. That's part of the problem Coleridge has about antinomianism. Um, So, um, so yeah, well, maybe I should have skipped to this because maybe I'm skipping to something I understand even less well. Well, I'll just say this is this consists basically of, of connections that I think are there, but I don't know how to make them more precise. So, you know, the fall of man uh, consists in Adam and Eve being thrown out as a garden. 
or it results in Adam and Eve being thrown out of the garden. Um, now, one question I was having when I thought about this, and you might ask why I would worry about this at this point, but when Adam and Eve leave the garden, are they going east or west? <laughs> Why am I interested in that? Well, because there's something going on with East and West here, right? Like in the poem at the beginning, the Lords of Life are marching from East to West. So that's one point. And then another point is that um, um, and ready to die out of nature. It's 73. This is in the reality section. This is when he's really up. I feel a new heart beating with the love of the new beauty. I'm ready to die out of nature and be born again into this new yet unapproachable America I have found in the West. So there's there's a kind of discovery of something not yet discovered, although people think they've discovered it, right? Like they think they've already discovered America in the West, but really it's not yet approachable. So um, they, they have you know you have to go farther west to make the discovery. <laughs> um, but uh, this but the. the the fall from the Garden of Eden results in an unhappy discovery. The discovery, so I don't know, does that mean they didn't go far enough or they went the wrong direction? Anyway, uh, like, well, to make a long story short, it's from the Bible, it seems like they're going west. But, um, but it also seems from the Bible, like so Eden, the garden was actually not in Eden, but east of Eden. It actually says that a river flew out of Eden and watered the garden. There's the river flowed, not flew, flowed out of Eden and watered the garden. So um, so, so what? Well, nothing from the point of view of the Bible. It still seems like they were going east because, I mean, the only way you can tell is that it says that God set up a like, fiery sword and whatever on the east of the garden to keep them out. So that is why they were going this way. But at the end of Paradise Lost, Milton says, I mean, he seems to say both. He says that turning back, they saw the east of Paradise. So that would mean they're going this way. But he also says the last line of Paradise Lost is about how through that through Eden took their solitary way, which implies they're going this way. <laughs> I, I don't know. Anyway, that's probably unprofitable. Yeah. Okay, just real quick. Uh, Eden was like between Tigers and the Euphrates, right? Is that something else? Tigers and Euphrates are somewhere in this picture. I didn't figure that out. Yeah. I mean, there's Tigris and Euphrates are among the rivers that are supposed to flow out of Eden. Oh. Yeah, but I don't remember if it said what direction they're going. Oh. Um, so uh, I don't think that's the same as the water that flows into the garden. Anyway, um, so that's kind of a dead end, maybe, uh, or maybe it's important. I mean, I'm emphasizing what Milton says at the end of Paradise Lost because I would think that that would be at least as much on Emerson's mind as what it says in the Bible, right? Like that's, you know, so um, maybe the fact that there really is some confusion about what direction they're going at that point is actually important. But um, but in any case, so, uh, so, so one point possibly is that you know, here we actually did discuss, describe the discovery that you, sh that you should make. 
right? And then here we're discussing, we're back to discussing the wrong way of making the discovery. Um, the other thing that seems to be raised here, when we think of Adam and Eve, oh, I looks like I'm out of time. Yeah, maybe, um, Yeah, no, I don't know. I'll just say the other thing that seems to be raised here, we mentioned Adam and Eve, is that, the, the, that another thing that Emerson says in this section is that marriage in the spiritual world is impossible because the, um, because, I think it's right, because of the inequality between every subject and every object. Right, so like physical marriage is a relationship between two bodies, I guess. This also is, marriage is also an example that Coleridge went into a lot about marriage as a symbol, why it doesn't count as one of the sacraments, et cetera, et cetera. So um, the marriage in the spiritual world would have to be marriage between a subject and a subject. And Emerson is saying at this point, that's impossible because the subject never finds another subject. It always just finds an object that's not equal to it. Um, so, you know, that might suggest that part of this wrong discovery here was the wrong relationship between Adam and Eve to begin with. Um, <clears throat> that, uh, and I guess you could even give a kind of radical feminist reading of what's going on here. But, all right, I don't have anything more to say. We're out of time. So, <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that's a good segue because we're talking about Margaret Fuller next week. So maybe, maybe I'll be able to make a connection. Okay. See you then.